And then once we have the mass balance information, then um, we can use this information to determine our uh, special population um, a strategy. Uh, and the traditionally, when I think about the special population, so it's so either related to the pediatric population as well as the, the renal in, uh, impaired pay, uh, population and the hepatic impaired um, population. So why we need to do a renal impairment study? So if your drug ha- uh, is likely to be used in patient with a renal impairment, and uh, the renal excretion is maybe, and for your drug and, and or uh, active mortality, maybe more than thirty percent uh, related to the total drug. So you may be, uh, you may be expected to conduct a dedicated uh, renal impairment study. And also, if your drug is not a small molecular a supporting drug, but uh, the molecular uh, size, molecular weight is very small, less than the 69K uh, Dalton, then you also uh, will be expected to conduct the uh, dedicated uh, renal impairment studies. Then for the hepatic impairment study, uh, similarly, if your uh, drug is expected to be absorbed dose chronically, and then the, the liver uh, is is expect to be a major have a major contribution to your uh, drug uh, metabolism and uh, elimination. You will be uh, expect to conduct the uh, uh, hepatic impairment study, or if your drug have a, a very narrow therapeutic window. In that case, regardless whether um, the the liver uh, play a major role in terms of a drug uh, uh, excretion, you uh, also to expect to do the hepatic the impairment studies, and the really the the goal here is to use the staff, uh, uh, study information to guide the dosing uh, in those two uh, special populations. So for the renal impairment study, um, then the renal impairment is really to be uh, informed by uh, estimation of the uh, uh, creatinine clearance. And on the top here, I'm just copying the FDA guidance. So you can see there are different category of the renal impairment. And then you want to understand whether your drug candidate uh, may be used in in patient with the uh, end stage renal disease, so in the kidney fa- failure. And if that's unlikely, then you uh, probably don't need to worry about you know study the drug in patient with with a dialysis, etc. And then the typical renal impairment study you want to study is a parallel design, and you want to study the drug exposure follow the single dose in a, a volunteer with a various degree of the uh, renal impairment. And then if you don't expect the renal impairment to have a, a significant impact on your drug exposure, you could also potentially do a reduced uh, renal impairment uh, study. So pretty much you just just do a one cohort with a severe renal impairment. And if that, uh, if you don't observe any clinical relevant change in exposure with, with the se- severe impaired subjects, then you don't need to do the moderate on the male cohort. Um, and the alternative approach is will be also just without doing a dedicated study, then use the uh, public characterization and to access the impact of the renal impairment on your drug exposure. But in order to do that, you have to convince your team to um, allow enroll of the subjects with various degree of renal impairment in your phase two or phase three study. And the last actually is not typically being done right now. Then similarly for the hepatic impairment study, um, you the you want to it's also a uh, uh, open label parallel design, and really here is to uh, enroll uh, volunteers with various degree of the hepatic impairment, which is characterized by the child pill um, criteria, um, and uh, and you will also want to enroll the um, what we call the health the matched health volunteer. It's really based on the. Uh, baseline demographic information such as gender, body weight, uh, sex, etc. Uh, and the similar idea here is to just compare the various degree of the hepatic impairment, um, on the the impact with a, a different degree of a hepatic impairment on the drug exposure. Uh, you could also do a full design, and then you have or do a reduce the hepatic impairment design. But if you do a reduced design, there then there may be some limitation in terms of the uh, drug label. So last related to the metabolism, sorry. 
Okay, so so that's related to the drug metabolism and excretion. Then the next characterization very important for related to the clinical pharmacology is the uh, DDDI assessment. So uh, in the broader term, you know, when we talk about drug drug interaction, that may relate to the to the PK, PD, or you know clinical response. But when we uh, talk about the clinical clean farm DDI study, typically it's about the uh, PK DDI DDI assessment and specifically related to the um, small molecule. And really, the reason we need to do the uh, study is that we want to inform the dose when uh, when you drug candidates is being co-administrated with the other uh, drug, whether you need to do, do a dose adjustment or not. And uh, the clinical DDI study can be characterized into the two different categories. So the first one is to investigate whether you drug uh, whether whether your drug impact the PK of the other uh, co co uh, medicines. So this is what we call a perpetrator study. Then the second category is that whether other drug may have an impact on your drug on your drug candidate. And in this case, we call we typically call it a victim or substrate uh, DDI studies. So. Typically, we want um, it, it's prefer to do the clinical DDI study early in the uh, clinical development. Uh, development, in particular, if you have a drug, have a concern of your drug candidates with some um, uh, co-concurrent medicines with, in, in the target patient populations, and you want to do such a DDI assessment before you starting the clinical trial uh, in patients. And really, here is just to ensure. Um, so it's patient safety and efficacy, because you know if there's some severe DDI uh, incidents that may really trigger um, unwanted AE um, and can be detrimental to your trial. So for a victim study, so if your drug is um, uh, if a certain metabolism enzyme is uh, is believed to have a major contribution to your drug, let's say if you, if based on the perkinol information and you have some estimation suggests that maybe six three A uh, is responsible for more than a quarter of your drug inhibition in humans, then you may want to conduct a DDI study with a strong six three inhibitor as well as the as well as the strong six three inducers. And then for the um, appropriate studies, uh, and uh, and typically you want if if the preclinical information suggests that you drug the drug is a, a potential inhibitors of a certain enzyme in humans, um, then you want to do a DDI study using a sensitive index substrate. Uh, in this case, for six for six three A, typically you want to do a DDI studies uh, with a midazolam, which is uh, a sensitive six three A uh, substrate. And sometimes you may also need to do a DDI study related to the transporters. And here, there's there's no general rule, and really, uh, is uh, is um, uh, case by case evaluations. So you want to think about okay, what's the likelihood that the patient may take the you target patient population may take some drug that are either transferred or substrate and uh, or uh, taking some drug that may be uh, a perpetrator of the um, um, transporter. And what's the therapeutic window of you, you, your drug and then then to determine whether you want to conduct any uh, de dedicated transport drug transporter um, studies. And then, and also in the bottom here, I'm at attaching their also, some spec, uh, show DDI considerations, and this is because FDA issued uh, two guidance to my at least to my awareness. Once related to the DDI related to uh, 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 with the acid reducing agents, and, and another one is the DDI assessment for the oral uh, contraceptive. So those are I would say some special case, and uh, actually the guidance are, are quite clear. Um, and they tell you and under what scenario you may need to consider um, conduct the DDSM study with those two school of the drugs. And then uh, here I'm just showing uh, a drug uh, label insert of the COVID uh, medicines. This is the uh, oral COVID uh, medicine invented by Fi Pfizer. Probably a lot of people are aware of this. It's the uh, uh, Paxlo Pax Paxlovid. Um, and um, 
this drug save, I would say probably saved the uh, life from lots of uh, people, but also it actually does have a lot, uh, quite a strong uh, DDI liabilities. And it's very um, informative label in terms of the DDI consideration and how um, the DDI knowledge uh, uh, is used to uh, in the drug label to guide the use of the of the drug. So I will in, in, encourage everyone to uh, just take a look if you are interested. And I would say you, now if you do a clinical trial, it's very likely uh, you may have a patient outside to ask you, okay, how to, what's the DDI liability of your drug candidate with this drug? Because this is so commonly being used right now. Then the next, uh, the last study I want, want to talk about is the TQT studies. Uh, and really this, this the goal of this study is to evaluate the TQT plantation risk of your drug candidates. And uh, typically it's a uh, double blind, uh, randomized crossover study. Um, and there are uh, four treatment R. So you want, um, you are expect to study, uh, one R will be the clinical dose of your drug candidate and also a super, um, a clinical dose, which means like a dose maybe two or three, four higher than you, uh, target the clinical dose. And then you also be expect to include two arm. One is the placebo control arm, and the, another one is the positive control arm to establish the uh, assay sensitivities. Um, nowadays, I would say this, the, the regulatory agents actually encourage you, the sponsor to use the concentration uh, drug more ER modeling, which we call the CQT modeling, to replace this dedicated uh, TQT studies. Um, but uh, you know, under certain scenario, you may still want to do these studies. And then really the here, the main goal is to just to ensure your drug it does not have a clinically significant uh, QT plantation risk and uh, to meet the uh, regulatory expectation. Because uh, for at each NDA, there will be the, what FDA called the integrated safe, uh, review team to review the drug QT plantation risk as well as the cardiovascular safety risk um, and, and uh, so the cardiovascular uh, deviation. So this study or TQT or CQT modeling will be very important uh, knowledge uh, uh, data generation for that review. So. Um, that's about the, the experimental clinical pharmacology characterization. And, uh, and uh, as the speaker's person mentioned, on top of that, and there are more and more utilization of the modeling tool. So one important tool is the PPK model. Um, and as I just mentioned, that can, this PPK modeling can be used to access the drug absorption, viability, as well as the DDI assessment, and also to inform the uh, special uh, population de uh, design. So this has become one very useful tool um, for any clinical pharmacologist. And the, besides PPK modeling, and uh, typically we will also conduct uh, the pop population PK modeling as well as the uh, ER analysis. And uh, here really is, is to use the pharmacometric approach to understand the variability we observed in the clinical development and uh, also select or screen and select any potential uh, significant covariant that may have a clinical relevant impact on the uh, drug uh, uh, on the drug exposure. So I would say the modeling po uh, approach and it's become more and more useful and it's very good uh, complement and analysis versus uh, with the experimental uh, dedicated clinical pharmacology studies. So. And the, and nowadays we're using more and more uh, uh, modeling approach, and uh, I think we it's very similar to the uh, toxicology world. And people saying, okay, you can have a, a three R to reduce the animal use. And really, here we are seeing more, more and more using modeling tool to refine uh, the design of the clinical uh, dedicated clinical study and uh, reduce the need to conduct dedicated uh, uh, clinical studies. And then just maybe overall summaries. So the, the clinical knowledge and characterization play a very important role, um, uh, role in the first in human characterizations. And uh, then through the drug development, the, the clinical uh, characterization is very 
uh, it's a critical co- component to determine the dose uh, for your clinical study. And that, in you know, will have, typically have a very important impact on your program uh, success rates. And uh, then we're now using more and more modeling tools as a complement uh, uh, approach to with experimental token factorizations to uh, to inform the drug label and guide your uh, clinical uh, design. So in the end, here I just want to uh, thank um, the organizer for inviting us um, here to give you a talk. And here, this is a picture of the King Far department in Genentech. As you can see, we have uh, almost 100 folks here uh, with a different background, the King pharmacology background, pharm- pharm- pharmacology, data science, uh, and uh, you know, even AI scientists. Um, the, yeah, and uh, I think that's my, my, my talk. And, uh, if you have any question, feel free to reach out to us. Yeah.